Hi everyone, Jack here. With the Shadow of the Erd Tree trailer that recently dropped last week, it kind of gave us a lot of new information that should help recontextualize how we understand the base game of Elden Ring, as well as give us hints to what we could expect for the lore and story moving forward. From what we saw in the trailer, we saw imagery of beasts, we saw imagery of the Crucible, we saw Godwin's Golden Lightning, and we got to meet a brand new character, Mesmer the Impaler, with his uh, red hair like Radigan, and Miyazaki confirming that he is a child of Merica. He also has this very interesting red and black flame. If you are unfamiliar, there is a theory, um, a butterfly theory, that each of the butterflies within Elden Ring represents a demigod, and we can use those butterflies to essentially find where their influence is throughout the world. The nascent butterflies representing Mikola, the Aeonian butterfly representing Melania, and for a time, uh, I think general consensus was that the smoldering butterfly represented Melina. Now with Mesmer the Impaler thrown into the mix, it kind of looks like this smoldering butterfly may be his butterfly. So what I want to do is I want to replay the game with you guys. Um, we're going to go through either a major area or a major level through the base game of Elden Ring and use what we saw from the trailer to kind of think through what we'll see in Shadow of the Earth Tree and try and understand maybe what is the history of this land of shadow. Um, if you f have followed any of my videos previously, you know I'm very interested in this long faded sun realm. Uh, and to me, I think that this Shadowlands may in fact be that long faded sun realm. Um, what we know from interviews with Miyazaki is that these land of shadows used to be part of the lands between, but something happened where it got displaced and disconnected. We also know that this is where Marika first set foot. It's also where she became a god, and it's also the birth of the Erd Tree. So with that in mind, you know, we have to look at the Crucible. We have to look at beasts. We have to look at the culture of Far Missoula and the ancient dragons. Um, Godfrey's ascension. Uh, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff. And I think we can do that uh, partially now through looking at the base game. So our first place that we're gonna look at is the Weeping Peninsula. Uh, the Weeping Peninsula is, you know, it's probably not somewhere you go that often anymore, um, but it has a lot of interesting stuff uh, lying around that may give us a hint to what is going on in the Land of Shadows. Uh, this is pre-recorded gameplay. I played this a few days ago and I edited it down. Um, the build that we're going with is a Banished Knight using Ancient Dragon Incantation and some Storm uh, skills. The reason I chose Banished Knight is because Castle Morn and many of the other castles found throughout the Lands Between all have the Banished Knight um, armor sets and weapons scattered throughout. Uh, you can even find them in uh, the Fortified Manor and Round Table Hold. Uh, Edgar the Castilian of Castle Morn also wears the Banished Knight armaments. Uh, in a moment, I think I'm going to show the build for this character. Um, we can look at some of the items. We also just picked up a Smoldering Butterfly on the Bridge of Sacrifice. Uh, the Weeping Peninsula is also, I think, the last stop for Godfrey and his Tarnished uh, for the Long March of the Tarnished. So here we're just going through the build, looking at just, you know, dragon incantation stuff. I... I the Banished Knights can be found in places like Stormvale Castle, using storm spells, the Dragon Communion Church in Kaled, uh, so we know that they participate in Dragon Communion. They can be found in Castle Sol, the Castle of the Sun, commanded by uh, Commander Nile, who is in wreath with golden lightning. Um, and we also find them in Far Missoula, which is this uh, ancient mausoleum for the dragons. By looking at their armor, we can see that we have dragon ornamentation on the helmet, as well as a horn on the side. So between the dragon communion and looking at their armor, we can tie their relationship to something to do with the ancient dragons and their dynasty. Uh, also, their armor is really heavy, so I have to use Vike's Dragon Bolt to medium roll. 
this is a uh, new game plus four, really not a build character, so the gameplay might be poor and the stats aren't that good. Uh, looking at the Banished Knight's quality halberd, we have given the knights who, whether by misfortune or misdeed, were forced to abandon their homes. Most of these knights were sent to the fringes, where they were forced to start anew with only despair for company. Um, I also put Stormcaller on this one, which is channels the Tempest of Stormvale. So looking at this information right here, you know, these are knights. They have an ancient motif. When we think ancient, you know, I have to, I think before the Erd Tree, um, they all are, they, they are knights sent to the fringes, fringes, uh, I guess like Limgrave and the Weeping Peninsula also up in the mountaintops. They're sent very far away. You know, you don't find, I don't think you find any banished knights in Landell or in that surrounding area. I think we'll see one of their other uh, items that explain kind of what happened to their homeland. Oh, if you could see the timestamp, this is like 52 minutes of gameplay, so we, got, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, their shields, most of these knights are sent to the fringes. Yep, okay, same one again. Oh, here we go. Um, now, forced to abandon their home, that's the same one. So we don't know why they were forced to abandon, they were forced to abandon their home, but we don't know why. I gave them a gravel stone seal just because we got some lightning incantations. Uh, what I'm trying to do with this series is I want us to kind of do like, um, like a, sh it's like a live stream, but not really, you know, just kind of a, uh, just my thoughts flowing to kind of do research for future videos. So, you know, it's going to be a little sloppy. It's not going to, this isn't scripted. It's just, I think a fun way for me to share how I research the videos with all of you guys. So we got the Banished Knight helmet. You can see the dragon ornamentation very clearly on the top. Um, this helm was worn by knights who, whether by force or misdeeds, were forced to abandon their homes. These fierce warriors were each and all accomplished. Perhaps that's, that is why, despite their territorial losses, they were still named knights. So they lost territory, but because of their prowess, they're still named knights. We don't know where that territory they lost was. Perhaps it was Stormvale Castle. Perhaps it was the Fortified Manor. Um... This one is a little different. Perhaps the deep red scarf was used to block the winds from the outskirt. The winds bite with a sting stinging fierceness. Um, to me, I think that, you know, wherever Farm Missoula was located is the territory that they most have, must have lost. Um, we see in the trailer this giant, um, this like uh, automaton who... Let me just pause it for a moment. We find we fight, find this giant automaton, this like giant fire thing. You know, it's like a fire giant, and it has this crest on its chest that almost looks like the sun. Um, now you might be saying, you know, how are you getting the sun realm from the banished knights? Uh, if you go into the farm Great Bridge, you will find uh, the sun relief on there. Maybe a sun, maybe a flower. If you go to Castle Soul for Commander Niles' boss room, there is a sun relief in his boss room. And throughout all of Farm Azula, you find this sun relief everywhere. So when I think Sun Realm, I think it might be Farm Azula. Uh, we also, I threw Old Lord's Talisman on this guy. He loves Daddy Platy Sidisax. So, you know, it's said that the ancient royal city of Farmazula has been slowly crumbling since time immemorial. And this legendary talisman depicts the ancient king whose seat lies at the heart of the storm beyond the time. Um, so this is kind of what we're going with. We're, he, he's kind of doing a homecoming. You know, this guy, he's coming back to uh, take what's his. Uh, also throw the Great Shield Talisman on here. Legendary talisman of wrought iron depicting a massive ancient dragon. The ancient dragons who ruled in the prehistoric era before the Earth Tree would protect their lord as a wall of living rock. And so it is that the shape of the dragon has become symbolic of all manner of protection. So the thing that jumps out here is that the prehistoric era before the Erd Tree. We know that the Land of Shadow is where the Erd Tree was born and America became a god. So it's important for us to kind of look at the culture of anything that's before the Erd Tree. So we can kind of figure out what led to the lands between coming the way it is. And with the Banished Knights having this dragon ornamentation, we can, I think, almost firmly say that these knights lost their territory because of the war against the Erd Tree. Lightning Scorpion Charm, nothing uh, special there, and then Shard of Alexander. Oh, so this is funny. So I didn't have the helmet for this character, so I put on all the normal stuff to uh, farm the uh, Silver Scarab Talisman, um, and then I think I eat a Silver Pickle. And you'll notice 
on my character's head is the silver tear mask. Now, <laughs> this is the only item in the game, I think, that just genuinely boosts your arcane, which is boost item discovery. So if you're trying to do a cosplay build, this is something you would want to wear. Um, I make it no secret uh, how I feel about mimics on this channel. I mean, the channel's name is Jack is a Mimic. And it's kind of funny that if you want to cosplay as a certain type of character within Elden Ring, well, first you have to cosplay as a Mimic. I have uh, a theory that our player character, our Tarnished, might possibly be a Mimic themselves. Um, I don't think that's something that we'll actually figure out in the DLC. You know, I don't think that's something that, that's really going to come to fruition. Um, it's just, you know, our character could be a silver tier. They could not be. But in reality, you know, everything that you do in this game is kind of mimicry. The armor that you wear is you're mimicking someone else. Um, the If you do a cosplay build, like if you see in my other videos where a cosplay is Guts, you know, he's not really Guts. He's just, he's mimicking Guts. Um, many of the bosses repeat, and that's kind of a sense of mimicry. Um, you know, mimicry is at the core of Elden Ring. The animations and the style is mimics Dark Souls and Demon Souls. The story was written by George R. R. Martin, and it kind of mimics um, a, a Song of Ice and Fire. So, you know, whether or not our character is officially a silver tier mimic, no matter what, mimicry is always at play. Not just in Elden Ring, but in, you know, any form of art. You know, I got a tattoo of the Dragon Slayer right here. I love Berserk. But, like, Berserk mimics uh, Fist of the North Star and Conan the Barbarian. Um, you know, there's, there's inside jokes within there where a puck turns into Yoda. So, you know, mimicry is through all forms of art. Um, and it's something you can't get away from. We just spoke to Arena there, and she said, I think the... Um, you know, the, the slaves or the misbegotten, they did an uprising. Um, the misbegotten are beings of the crucible. I think their items say that they touched the crucible and they were punished for it. We know that from the trailer that crucible imagery is very important, and it seems like they have a culture that was existed before um, the Erd Tree. The crucible, I guess, eventually turned into the Erd Tree based on some of the item descriptions. What's interesting about Godfrey is that his knights were the Crucible Knights, and they were seen as chaotic. Um, and we know that the ancient dragons attacked Landell, and they used to, uh, Placidusax used to be the the um, the Elden Lord before uh, Godfrey. He Maybe he's the first, maybe he was the one previously before him, but uh, the dragon was, you know, the symbol of lordship. Then this barbarian Godfrey comes along with his crucible knights and they fight each other. So you kind of see um, you see issues between crucible and dragons. Uh, right here we have the old fang. These multiple overlapping fangs grow from a single root. Perhaps they're a vestige of the primordial crucible. So, you know, we know the cr crucible is primordial. And we have these slaves, these uh, misbegotten slaves. And the Castilian of the castle is an ex-banished knight. So to me, I see um, a conflict between the, the side of the banished knights and the dragons and the crucible, and probably Godfrey as well. So we're kind of, you know, our banished knight character is coming back. He's doing a little homecoming to the Weeping Peninsula, and he's going to get a little bit of revenge on these, uh, these, these disgusting crucible type. Um, here we're fighting a knight's cavalry. Uh, we know that the Knight's Cavalry are the, I guess, like the fist of the Fell Omen. You know, this is a uh, Margot's or Morgoth's, you know, personal um, vigilante crew. And it seems that he has an interest in the Weakened Peninsula, too. Whatever that may be. You know, he is an omen, but he seems to disdain himself being an omen. Uh, taking a look at the Knight Rider flail, nothing really interesting there. Doesn't really help build us on what we're trying to learn about the Shadowlands. Uh, this guy actually has some pretty interesting stuff. So, first thing that's interesting is, if I, okay, all right, there we go. The Red Thorn uh, Shield. An emblem in an ancient thorn design. Though it isn't much, it boosts fire damage negation. So, for some reason, the thorn is, uh, uh, conflicts with fire. We know that Radigan puts uh, his thorns on the Erd Tree, and then eventually we burn down the Erd Tree. Um, the thorns are also for the guilty. 
Uh, they perform blood magic. So for some, for whatever reason, anci- in ancient times, thorns are an emblem that's supposed to ward away fire. So, you know, keep your eye out for thorns. And I guess if you think thorns, think opposite of fire. This is the type of stuff that we're going to be, you know, trying to look at in this type of video series. And I implore you guys to, in the comments, kind of put your observations too. You know, I'm only one guy. I can't figure it all out myself. Um, so, you know, I request that you guys help me as well. The other, we have two, actually two other very interesting items that the merchant sells, if I ever, um, show it. So we have the Crimson Amber Medallion, Erdtree's old sap becomes amber, treasured as the most precious jewels in the age of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, a primordial life. Oh, hey, go back. This is why we pause it, because I'm too, I guess I was too hasty when I was recording. A primordial life energy resides inside. So we have the primordial, primordial crucible, a little flower design in the emblem, which is, uh, we'll talk about flowers in a little bit later in the video. And uh, the earth tree's old sap becoming ember, uh, jewel, uh, precious jewel, uh, age of Godfrey. It makes sense that it's in the weeping peninsula because we know this is kind of like the last stop on the long march of the tarnish before they all sail away. Um, so it makes sense that this merchant would own this. Um, and also the, that the Godfrey and in his age, primordial life energy, primordial crucible wasn't seen as heretical. You know, we don't know when the crucible became, uh, something that was disdained yet. Um, with Godfrey having two omen children, um, it's hard to say when they were, you know, locked underground. Was it at birth? Was it after Godfrey, um, was expelled? Uh, it's hard to say. We know he has a crucible knights later, they become chaotic. So it's, it's hard to say when that happened. We also have scale armor. Uh, the cape covering the shoulders is made, treated rock lizard skin and provides ample protection against fire. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking that when we see scales and stuff, I think we should think of like dragons. Um, even though it says, uh, like a rock lizard, I think this is the only mention of rock lizards at all in Elden Ring, but any scaled armor, anything with scales, I, I think we should relate that to the dragons because they have their gravel stone scales and their, their scales are what give them more mortality. Um, and it also provides protection against fire. I don't know if Dragons are fire resistant, but they are rocks, so maybe they are fire resistant. But, you know, I see we have Godfrey's emblem, his token, and we have the, you know, we have Castle Morn, which has the Banished Knights. So it makes sense that some people here would try to mimic the dragons by wearing uh, these scales. And we're just sitting and we're waiting. Uh, here we are looking at the map for the Weeping Peninsula. Uh, the peninsula to Limgrave South, it's named for its unceasing rainfall, redolent of lament. It's a very sad place. It also kind of looks like Australia, and Australia, I think, used to be a prison colony for the English, so I guess that makes sense. Uh, shout out to you Australians. You got your own map in Elden Ring, that's pretty cool. Up here is where we find a sorcerer tower that has... Um, oh, first we have to pick up the turtle shield. So this one's kind of funny because it has um, the, so the barricade shield, which is skill made famous by Sir Needheart. Um, he's the only, the only mention of Sir Needheart. I wonder who he is. Since we find the shield here, maybe Sir Needheart is like a banished knight or something, or maybe it's just like a fun name that they just threw in there. You know, who's to say? Um, we don't really hang out with the Sorcerer Tower here. There's not really much uh, information for us to get here other than... Um, this sorcerer tower has wolves in front of it, and the Karians seem to have a relationship with the wolves. They have an oath to the wolves. Uh, Renala summons them in her boss fight, so that leads me to believe that might be a Karian tower. Here we have the Star Callers, and then an Alabaster Lord gets summoned. The opposite of the Onyx Lords with their silver. Um, who knows why they're summoning meteors here? What they're doing here? They also do the um, the Golden Order totality um, pose. Uh, e even though, you know, they might not be Golden Order fundamentalists, so who knows? Now we're coming up on a big one. There's not many interesting things in here other than the name of the next com uh, upcoming area. With our new character, Mesmer, uh, he we know that he's called Mesmer the Impaler. In the mountaintops of the giants, you see the fire giants all impaled with something that kind of looks similar to his spear. And in the Weeping Peninsula, we have the Impaler's Catacomb. 
Uh, is there any relation? You know, I don't know. There might be a relation between Mesmer, the Impaler, and the Impaler Catacombs. I would assume there is, but again, there's not many interesting things in this dungeon other than its name. But we're kind of going to let it play out and see what we see. Um, one thing interesting, actually, about Catacombs, I don't know how long we play in this level. I think we play through the whole thing. Um, so let's just talk about Erdtree Burial while this goes through. The Erdtree, you know, we, we know that the Erdtree wasn't always there. So Erdtree Burial wasn't always a thing that occurred within the Lands Between. Um, it's probably this, you know, at a time in a cult practice, you know, before the Golden Orders form, before the Rune of Death is plucked out, you know, death happened with the Death Birds. They were raked in this cold flame. And, um, but the Golden Order forms, and now people are getting buried into this Erd Tree. Um, I assume before that's the Rune of Death is plucked out of the, um, the Elden Ring, you know, these Erd Tree cultists, these maybe Crucible cultists, who knows, are doing Erd Tree burial to, 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 to grow their burgeoning tree. Uh, the Erd Tree produces this sap and this dew that invigorates life force, but it requires people's bodies and their souls in order for it to grow. So, you know, it might not be a very pleasant thing to do Erd Tree burial, and that's why so many people were opposed to it. Uh, they would also be opposed to it because if one person controls this tree, then they are the ones who get power from the dew and the sap. And that's why you have these catacombs filled with imps. They're protecting the roots. They don't want anyone coming in here and trying to do anything to the roots and destroy their tree at the source. Uh, here we have what's probably why it's called Impaler's Catacomb. It goes up into the sky to uh, the ceiling to impale you with spikes. And then what's interesting is you go down beneath and now it's a sewer. Uh, the people roaming around here are not those who live in death. They are just uh, you know, like guys who can't die. Um, they're kind of rotten, they're, they're, their organs are falling out, but they're not those who live in death. They're just people who can't die. Um, and <laughs> the proud plate says, Peace, please help. So these people are not doing too hot. Um, it's kind of weird that this is like a sewer down here. Like, why, why is there waste coming into this, uh, this Erdtree burial site? This is not the only place that is like an Erdtree burial is also for, um, like an Erdtree burial catacomb has like sewage in it. it it's kind of weird. But that's kind of like, you know, what, what we're looking at with the catacombs, that that Erdtree burial was something that was, you know, seen as a cult, and, you know, people who wanted to grow the tree is something that they wanted to do. Um, they build these catacombs, they build, they get these golems somehow to protect them. And in here, we're actually going to see, I think, the burial watchdog. And we're going to see some really bad gameplay, because uh, I didn't play very well in this section. I kind of... Oops. Um, what we have that's interesting here is that first it's a watchdog, so we have to think of like the beasts, uh, Sarash, King of Beasts, Malaketh, the Shadows, um, Blythe. Um, so there may have been an alliance between the Erd Tree and the beasts. Um, we see the Lion Dancer, who has like crucible horns and is also you know a lion. Um, so, you know, there may be, you know, that's how there is a relation between the beast and the Erd Tree because they're crucible related. Um, it's interesting that he uses fire actually, uh, around the roots. I guess, you know, he doesn't really care. Um, later we're going to actually look at his staff, the Erd Tree Burial Watchdog staff and kind of like deduce where these guys came from. But, you know, we, we could see that it's important for them to protect the roots, and somehow they have the ornamentation of beasts and dogs doing that protection of the roots. We get demi-human ashes, and I don't think that was interesting, so I didn't look at it. If you think it's interesting, you tell me in the comments why I should have looked at it. Next, we're coming up on the Castle Morn uh, ramparts to kind of get a look at the surrounding area. We're not gonna go to Castle Morn just yet, we're saving that for last, but we see this giant castle with smoke billowing from the top. We see also uh, the Farm Azula architecture that fell from the sky, uh, littering the ground. Um, there's a stone golem from, which I think is the Blackstone civilization. I think those are repurposed. Uh, they, those are much older than everything else we find within the Lands Between. Now we find, I think, our second pair of smoldering butterflies. You know, they're just hang hanging out by a fire, but they're in the ailing village where the Flame of Frenzy folks are hanging out. 
Um, it's interesting that these people in Castle in the Weeping Peninsula have succumbed to frenzy. Uh, and if you take a look at the uh, bonfire, you could see that it's Erd Tree commoners who are being burned. So these people are anti Erd Tree. Yeah, there's also I think there's a Church America here too, so it seems like maybe these you know maybe those are pilgrims, maybe they they're just you know regular commoners, but it seems whoever is living these frenzied folk who are living in this town are or against the Erd Tree. We know that the Flame of Frenzy wants to or the Lord of Frenzy wants to burn down the Erd Tree, so it makes sense that all the people living here as well would be feel very negative towards any of the Erd Tree followers. I think right here is where we find the flame crest wooden shield. The yellow flame is the symbol of the affliction, serving as a warning to those who might approach the village. Carried by soldiers of the village that is afflicted with frenzy. It's interesting that they're carrying a shield to warn people not to come here. Oh, I screw up these rats. That was really cool gameplay with that NSX glaive on these frenzy rats. Yeah, it's interesting that in the Weeping Peninsula we find people afflicted with frenzy. You know, what led them to feeling so distraught? Um, I think we all know this stuff. The incantation originated with the maddening three fingers. You know, so, you know, we could say, is it just because they're in the fringe lands? Did something bad happen here? Um, who knows? And then we get our sacred tear and we see Merica in her crucifixion pose. Um, where are we going next? Oh, we're going up to the Watchtower. I, one thing that's interesting, more smoldering butterflies, butterflies. One thing that's interesting about Merica's um, crucifixion pose is, you know, that's how what we find her in the Erd Tree before, um, that's where we find her, you know, before a fight with Radigan. She's crucified. And her statues, all the way up in the mountaintops of the Giants, all the way down to the Weeping Peninsula, shows Merica in this crucifixion pose. First Church America has her in that crucifixion pose, and we find her in the Erd Tree crucified. Um, from Enya's dialogue, from the two fingers, I think when she's strangling the two fingers, she says that, you know, Merica, she, she, her, her crime deserved uh, heavy punishment. And I think we're supposed to assume that she was crucified for shattering the Elden Ring. But why do all of her statues show her being crucified? You know, it may be like a welcoming pose, but, you know, that she looks, you know, she looks, she's in the same position as she is in the statues as we find her in the Erd Tree. So, you know, that leads me to believe that maybe Merica isn't a willful, um, a willful actor in becoming a god. Uh, Ronnie's whole quest line is this girl who doesn't want to be the next god and she fights her fate. She turns herself into a doll to fight a literal hand. The puppet does not want to be the plaything anymore. So, you know, it leads me to believe that maybe Merica, you know, maybe we'll learn this in the DLC, that Merica did not want to become a god and that maybe she was being puppeted, maybe by, you know, maybe by whoever, whoever pushed her to be, um, to become, to become queen or forced her. Or maybe it's the Elden Beast itself controlling her. Who knows? But, you know, I, 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 I think she might be a sympathetic character. So this is pretty funny. The hand ba uh, ballista, um, an unconventional ballistic device modeled on a weapon used to besiege castles. Perfect for reckless acts such, oh, excuse me. Perfect for reckless acts such as storming a castle or facing an entire army alone. I think, uh, I don't know if that's supposed to be like, like a, like an, an inside joke about someone else, like, but, or maybe someone did try to storm a castle all alone. Um, we know in Godfrey's, uh, items it says that he faced the storm lord alone so maybe this is a reference to god for facing the storm lord or, uh for facing the storm lord alone um oh this this is pretty cool so we have the uh, black stone here and then we come up on something really interesting we get our first trina lily which you know you gotta thank mikola and then we get on the uh the candlestick the candle tree. The candle tree is uh, the surreptitious design that foretells the burning of the Erd tree. You find the shield in the Sage's Cave. I have a whole video on that if you're interested in watching to learn more about that. Um, we find these in uh, the Halic tree in Elphiel. 
Um, and when you touch them, these spirit, these spiritual trees, uh, you cast uh, Vikes Dragon Bolt, and then a little guy, a little spirit guy, shows up to to lead you to some treasure or something. Um, I think those are there for Mikola, for Mikola placing those down for to help our tarnished character specifically to find something interesting. And I think in this cave, we will find something very interesting. So the Earth Boar Cave, you know, doesn't really have the craziest loot, but it does have some interesting lore bits. Uh, first, we get led here by Mikola's uh, apparition, who I'm assuming is Mikola's. We get a little trap here and fight some rats. Uh, that's not very interesting. So we're just going to let it play out. And we're going to watch it. You, got, you guys all watch like stream content before. Sometimes they're quiet when gameplay's happening. Pickled turtle neck. I think, uh, you know, the fringe lands, they love eating pickled turtles. All right. So we fight a room bear. He's big. He's sleeping. He was laying on top of two corpses. And uh, we killed him in one hit. So he drops the spell Drake Talismanship. Oh, hello, Luna. So, oh, you might see some cattail uh, in the video. So he drops the spell Drake Talisman. We, we already talked about the Great Shield Talisman. It has the same uh, item description, but since we find uh, a spell Drake Talisman, we should think that people who worship the ancient dragons or people who were allied with the ancient dragons have some relation to this area. Because we found this talisman, you know, this bear probably ate someone wearing this talisman. This protects against magic damage, and the bear does all physical damage, so it didn't really help him out. I don't know. Then we have these two corpses he was laying on, and they have some pretty interesting items. If we ever get to it. Okay. So the first guy has a smoldering butterfly. So now we're thinking Mesmer the Impaler and his smoldering butterflies. And then we also have... What do we have? Trina's Lily. So we have Mesmer's Smoldering Butterfly, and then we have Mikola as St. Trina Lily. So we have, you know, the two brothers kind of right next to each other, and Mikola's spirit tree ghost led us to this cave. And then we also have the Spelldrake Talisman. Um, so, you know, I don't know what that exactly is trying to tell us, but, you know, after seeing Mesmer in the trailers, like, it's very interesting that they're there together. Um, not really anything lore significant with the demi-humans over here. You know, it's just something that's in the level. Nothing really relevant for the, um, for our analysis right now. This has the Faith Knot tier in that basin. Uh, since it's New Game Plus 4, it's not there anymore. This is in the between Castle Morn and the rest of the Weeping Peninsula. It's a, I think, Morn Tunnel. Um, what's interesting about Morn Tunnel is that so we kind of established that this, the Weeping Peninsula, is probably controlled by banished knights and those affiliated with dragons, uh, you know, because Edgar wears this armor and the Spelldrake Talisman was found in Earthborn Cave. And now we have these slaves being forced to mine in the tunnels. We have a mixture of, oh, let's stop here. We have a mixture of uh, human miners and then Q-Triple miners. And we also find Exalted Flesh which is considered a delicacy in the Badlands. Um, this invigorating repast was for the exclusive benefit of those who they deem heroes. So this is probably something that uh, the Tarnished with Godfrey would eat, and when he went to the Badlands, his warriors would eat them as well. It's interesting that we find this in the cave. Could it be that some of the Tarnished who may have been left behind became slaves and had to work in this mine? Could be. I don't know if that's a stretch or not. Uh, later we get down to the scaly misbegotten. Um, so we we see we see these we see the slaves and the misbegotten, the crucible affiliated, having to work down in these tunnels. And when we kill this guy, we get the. What do we get? What do we get? We get the rusted anchor. The Rusted Anchor reads, When the Tarnished left the lands between with their lord, one boat alone was said to have been left behind. So, Long March ends, the Tarnished and Godfrey leave, all in boats, and then one is left behind. So that means there are some Tarnished still mucking about in the lands between. Um, this is probably a hint of something really significant happening. 
uh, but I don't know who that tarnish would be. Maybe that tarnish is, you know, related to the Weeping Peninsula. Maybe there's somewhere else. You know, I don't know. But we do find the exalted flesh in the tunnel, so maybe some tarnished became slaves for whoever the Castilian of Castle Morn is. Moving on. Moving on. Oh. This is outside of the tunnel, I think, and we find our next uh, Trina Loli. Yep, next Trina Loli. So that's two so far. Two that I found. There might be more that I missed. Uh, hit some Spirit Springs, more. What's actually, you know, what's really interesting here is, and I want to do a video about this, is that just like how unnatural the lands between are. You know, so many places, uh, the Ruinstrom uh, Ruin Precipice, on top of the Giants, Caled, Limgrave, Weeping Peninsula. It's all artificial, you know, that's it's built out of these pillars, you know. So, you know, I don't know what that's supposed to signify, but it's very interesting. Uh, we get the Golden Lightning. And uh, it reads, one of the incantation of the capital's ancient dragon cult. Ancestor of modern dragons, the ancient dragons had scales of gravel stone and wielded lightning as their weapon. It is said that they once attacked Leyendel, the ro uh, royal capital. Uh, later, we learn that Golden Lightning is Godwin's lightning. Um, I have a theory that I'm trying to work on, and it's going to be part of this larger video that this research is going into, that Godwin is not Godfrey's son. Um, Godfrey has the Crucible Knights, and he has the Omen Twins, which are related to the Crucible. And Godwin... Um, there's nothing in game that explicitly says that he's part of the Golden Lineage. He's just named Godwin the Golden. So it's assumed that he's part of the Golden Lineage. Yet he's allied with the Ancient Dragons. And when we find him as the Prince of Death, he's very aquatic and he has a fishtail. Or he looks like a sea dragon. Um, Godric himself, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of irony there would be if he was the descendant of a dragon yet he was doing his best to impress, you know, his ancestor, his supposed ancestor, Godfrey, um, by grafting Tarnish to his body to be like the Tarnished Elden Lord. And in the, in the end, before he dies, he grafts a dragon to his arm, his real ancestor. So there's a lot of more, there's more evidence I have for that, but I just, you know, want to float that theory with you all. It would also kind of, um, it kind of adds to that Crucible versus Dragon um, aspect where you have the Crucible and Godfrey's Crucible Knights and the primordial form of the Erd Tree is one section and then the Ancient Dragons and that lineage is another kind of like uh, alliance or family or whatever. And it would be very interesting if it turns out that Godwin was, you know, always opposed to maybe the Erd Tree, or maybe he was opposed to Godfrey, or, or who knows what, you know, did they know? Like, if he, if he is uh, a bastard, do they know that? Is it a secret? Did Godfrey know? Was it America's plan? Kind of makes it also interesting when we learn that uh, Godwin was supposed to be a martyr for destined death. If he is aligned with the ancient dragons and maybe a dragon, part dragon himself... Um, then maybe he does have some interest in being a martyr for destined death to end the current order and bring back the age of dragons. So, uh, that's something I'm, this is part of the research. So I'm kind of working for that bigger video, but I kind of want to float it with you guys early on in this kind of, you know, casual video. Uh, we fight the guardian, the tree guardians here. And what's interesting about these guys. Um, so now we know, you know, we kind of could assume that there was a time before the earth tree, but we have like, you know, concrete proof from Miyazaki himself that there is a culture before the Erd Tree that exists in the Land of the Shadow. And the Guardian Mask tells us that in accordance with an ancient pact with the Erd Tree, it is said that their deaths led not to destruction, but instead to renew eternal life as Guardians. Mm -hmm. So not to destruction. Does that mean they swore a pact with the Erd Tree that they wouldn't have to go into Erd Tree burial and their soul would be consumed um, I know there's a prevailing thought that the Erd Tree leads to rebirth, but that might not be the case if we look at uh, if we look at Dung Eater and we look at the Guardian Mask, where they get with an ancient pact, so way probably way back when, 
they get to have this eternal life renewed as guardians instead of being destroyed. So that could be an interesting implication to what Erd Tree Burial is actually and what happened at the beginning of the Erd Tree that this ancient pact was formed with these guardians. Probably something we will learn in Shadow of the Erd Tree. But it has to make you think. Uh, and then we fight, I'm going to fast forward a bit because we fight a Urtree avatar. Um, these guys, oh, didn't mean to fast forward that much. These guys start popping up after the Elden Ring was shattered, I think, and the seed spread, and they are the guardians of these little trees. Um, I guess if they're an Urtree avatar, I guess this is supposed to be the will of the Urtree. They're an avatar for the Urtree. Um, you know, I guess, I guess maybe the Urtree does have some personification. Um, oh, sorry, I just grabbed my water bottle, um, which is kind of interesting if the tree itself, you know, the tree can absorb souls. There's actually, um, in a lot of, sorry, I'll, I'll let it play, but I don't know where this is going. In a lot of George R. R. Martin's stories, not just A Song of Ice and Fire, but his sci-fi stories, there is, um, hive minds. There's a lot of, yeah, you don't screw it, we're going to pause it. There is a lot of hive minds within, um, his stories. Uh, his one of his biggest long long reaching stories. I mean, I guess it's not that long. It's just as as many pages as like um, like a Game of Thrones, like maybe nine hundred, eight one thousand pages. He has like twenty seven short stories for this uh, series called Thousand Worlds. It's a fi sci fi series, um, and it takes place in a universe where um, the Earth Empire, the Human Empire, is on a war with two fronts with these two hive mind. Um, these two hive mind alien races and uh there, there's one a song for leah where these investigators find this um this thing called i think the grishkin and she is like this witch that seduces people into this this hive mind she seduces humans specifically wants telepaths into this hive mind and it, it, they the, the individuality disappears and it feels like heaven um, there's theories within A Song of Ice and Fire that the Weirwoods, which are these trees seen as gods that used to have um, sacrificial uh, burials and sacrifices to the trees, human sacrifices to the trees, that when people die and get buried into the roots of these Weirwoods, their souls or their consciousness goes into this Weirwood... Did I say earth trees? I didn't say Weirwood. These weir this Weirwood hive mind. The weirwood net, as it's called. So it could very well be possible that the Erd Tree avatars and that Erd Tree burial kind of leads people into this hive mind of the Erd Tree and that it can be personified. Uh, but that's drawing from George R. R. Martin's other stories. You know, it, it's hard to say what, what was kept um, between what George R. R. Martin wrote for From Software and Miyazaki and, you know, what was changed. I, you know, I like to think that a lot of it was left unchanged. Uh, here we just find some fire on the ground for no reason, and then some smoldering butterflies. Uh, I don't, you know, it, I don't know what you're supposed to say about it. Like, you know, what I killed, I missed the sheep. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to say about it, but it is interesting knowing that you know we have this guy who is probably a child of America and Radigan, and he's got his own butterfly. Speaking of Radigan. Let's uh, roll up on one of his churches. I've seen a lot of people uh, think that this dialogue has to do with Mesmer. I really don't think so. I think this this is really just, this is talking about the Wandering Mausoleum. Um, I don't think this is talking about Mesmer. I don't, you yeah. know. What's interesting about Church of Pilgrimage, so is we have Radigan statue here, and Melina shows up to give us the last line of Queen America's dialogue for the Long March. So what does she say here? Yeah, so she reads out the full scheme of the tarnish. You'll live, you'll leave, you'll die, you'll come back. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll be my next Elden Lord. You'll you'll figure out my plan. It's just very interesting that there's two churches here. Well, there's three churches here, but there's two churches right next to each other, and one of them has Radigan here. Was this built afterwards? Uh, 
uh, was this built after uh, Godfrey was kicked out? And is it supposed to like you know say something about him being kicked out? Um, another you know theory I've seen and I've kind of thought about it too is that you know if Merica's Radigan, when we hear Merica's own words, is that really Radigan's own words? Is Radigan talking to Godfrey in in, in those situations? Uh, here's something that's interesting. So in this graveyard where you have those who live in death, you also have the spirit jellyfish, and the spirit jellyfish only pop up at night. Uh, we also have, like, you know, the aquatic theme with spirits and the afterlife, Godwin being a fish man, and um, spirit jellyfish, tibia mariners. So there's there seems to be an underwater theme when it comes to um, when it comes to the the undead. Uh, we also get the gilded. Let me go back to it. We're going to do a little uh, rewinding. You get the gilded iron shield. Um, this is a holy resistant shield. Makes sense that it'd be holy resistant in the Weeping Peninsula, in a graveyard with those who live in death, and uh, uh, Castle Morn, which seems to be a banished knight, and maybe Farmazula architecture, or maybe not Farmazula, but like Sun Realm related, um, because it's holy resistant, and holy is that of the Erd Tree. So this, you know, this I think we're seeing that this is a place that re was resistant against the Erd Tree. You know, the people here should be enemies of the Erd Tree. Um, the or crucible is the earth tree in primordial, uh, primordial form, so it also makes sense that they would enslave their enemies, the misbegotten who you know touched the crucible. And then we're just bashed on some skeletons. Again, we have the jellyfish leading us to the cave. I don't think they show uh, during the day, so if you play at night you have a better chance of finding places like the catacombs. Uh, this catacomb has death root on the walls, but no actual death root within here, but there is death root present causing the uh, undead to come back. There was a cookbook in there, I think. I don't know which one, though. Um, you know, what's interesting about those who live in death is that, you know, death root is not just, you know, I think we're going to fight a cemetery shade here. I didn't know I'd have a lot to talk about this. Um, death root is not just, you know, the root of death. It's also death to the roots. If you have death root in a catacomb, you cannot do earth tree burial because the soul can't return to roots. It returns back to the body. So you can't, you know, feed the earth tree. So it's a way to kill the earth tree by the production of death root. You've probably watched my eclipse video, and that's, you know, where we come to the... Um, conclusion that Mikola wanted death root to possibly kill the Erd tree. But now that we know that his body that we find in Mogwin is a husk and there's no soul there that he divested his flesh to go to the land of shadow, it seems that maybe Mikola would want death root to prevent his soul from being vacuumed up by the Erd tree so he can reach this land of shadow. Uh, here we have Lutel the headless. Uh, she wields a lance and robed in death. She's a mausoleum a headless knight who leads the mausoleum soldiers. She sacrificed her life so that in death she could continue to protect a soulless demigod uh, until their revi revival, earning her the hero's honor of Erd Tree burial. However, since death root already exists, by the time she gets her Erd Tree burial, she is ash unreturned to the Erd Tree. So we're, you know, I think what we're looking at spirit ashes. These are the actual ashes of these cremated heroes. And since they can't be returned to the Erd Tree, you have their physical body in your hand, in, your, in a pouch of, of their ash, and then with the bell, you can bring their spirit back to fight for you. So because of Death Root, we can summon spirit ashes. And the spirit calling bell is something that, you know, is given to us at the behest of Mikola through Ronnie. So it makes sense why Mikola will want Death Root. Now he has something for his tarnished that he wants to do stuff with. Um, he can summon spirits now to, uh, you know, assist him. It's all it's starting. The DLC trailer is starting to make a lot of sense for that eclipse video. So, and that came out before the DLC. Remember that. Uh, this uh, this is the Tombs Ward ruins. Interesting. So that was the Tomb Ward's catacomb, the Tombs Ward ruins, uh, warding meaning to protect. So this is the cat. This is the village to protect the catacombs. So you have a village specifically cre uh, uh, erected to protect the Erd Tree burial in a place that you know is probably hostile to the Erd Tree. And inside here, we get the uh, winged scythe. If you watched my um, Lost Souls of the Sages Cave video, we deduced that this oh. 
first we're going to talk about the Watchdog staff, and then we'll talk about the 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 scythe. Oh, and you heard Luna yelling because she uh, is, I don't know, she's special. Uh, Watchdog staff, large, Luna, come here. Large stone staff embedded with glintstone, wielded by the Erdtree burial watchdogs who protect catacombs. The watchdogs, battered and broken over their lengthy tenure, rule the catacombs and are even, are even said to co- command the imps. So what's interesting on this thing is we have the symbol here, which looks very similar to the symbol on the uh, painting of the old man and the impaled man in the DLC trailer. Um, I hypothesize that he might be um, America's father. And that the woman in the painting next to him is a pregnant Marika's mother. Her, uh, you know, you know, baby Marika's in there. Um, and he, you know, this is just this is a hypothesis, all speculation. Just trying to think. Um, he wants more power. He wants his Erd tree, so he offers up his daughter to become God Queen and hold the Elden Ring. Eventually, maybe he gets impaled and gets punished for that. You know, just some, just some ideas. Uh, this actually, I gotta look this up. I gotta look up what this word means. I don't think you'll see it. I'll have to put this in post. So, uh, crozier. So, what does crozier mean? A crozier is a hooked staff carried by a bishop as a symbol of pastoral office, the curled top of a young fern. So, we got some tree uh, language, a young fern, some, you know, plant. That's kind of very common in Elden Ring where. Words will have two meanings, and the second meaning is usually that of trees. Like scion is something to do with trees, um, and that you know, we think of scions the eternal cities. Um, golden bough, uh, that bough could be, I think, a tree branch, and also uh, bough means a main. Yeah, I guess main 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 branch of a tree is, but you know, when they talk about uh, Godwin. Um, golden bow, so you know, main, maybe maybe he's not a dragon offspring. I mean, he's a child of the golden bow. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that maybe that theory doesn't work out because of that line. We'll have to do some deducing. But anyway, so we have this, you know, crozier, uh, a bishop, something to do with a hook staff of a bishop. So sorcery of the bishop's hook staff. I don't guess let's guess maybe this was. And then if we think this looks like the that guy of the painting. In the DLC trailer, was he a bishop? Was he a was he a head of a religion? If it's Erdtree related, that could be. He could have been. I think also in the trailer it says Erdtree faithful. Like the dialogue goes Erdtree faithful, and then shows his face. So it could be that he was the premier bishop or priest for the burgeoning Erdtree religion. I guess then if it if he is Merica's father, that would kind of make sense that. This holy man, this of the Erdtree religion, would offer up his daughter for the Erdtree. Let me know if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. All right, we're almost halfway through. I hope you're having fun. I'm having fun, by the way. Oh, the winged staff. So this is what we find inside of this Tomb's Ward catacomb. Sacred scythe. Or say, yeah, winged scythe. Sacred scythe resembling a pair of white wings deals holy damage. According to pagan belief, white winged maidens are said to be death's gentle envoys. Um, then the unique st- skill is angel wings, and the white wings impede recovery actions using flask using a flask of tears. Um, and you imbue the winged blade with an armament with light. So it deals holy damage, and it's death's gentle envoys. Uh, I think the twin bird, it's either the twin bird or the death birds. They, you know, the, the death birds are the envoy of the twin birds. You know, the, the twin, what is it? The twin bird is an envoy of a forgotten God, most likely the God of death. And the death birds are the twin birds children. Since this says pagan beliefs, I kind of think that the winged scythe is supposed to be like the death bird's wings, but, you know, through some changing of whatever, like, you know, it's passed down through, you know, decades and generations that gets changed from death birds to angels. Um, in Farmazula, we find the twin bird relief at the very entrance. Uh, 
So, and if we think that the Weeping Peninsula is related to Far Missoula, the Banished Knights, and the Dragon Culture, uh, it would make sense we would find these this related to death birds, death gentle, gentle envoys, uh, these angel wings, and they were uh, they impede recovery of using flask of tears, which is you know. Uh, I think like it has like a seed of the Erd tree or something in there. You know, it has some Erd tree essence within the flask that we use to heal and recuperate mana. So, you know, we're getting more indication that this island is anti Erd tree or this peninsula. Uh, and then we find a bunch of Trina Lindelys, a lot of Trina Lindelys. So it looks like Mikola is interested in this area and the Winged Scythe and maybe that Tomb's Work Catacombs. Coming up, we're uh, coming up on the Everjail. I think, uh, I don't remember what this one's called. I know who's in it. It's a Weeping Everjail, so somebody's sad. Uh, could be the Weeping Peninsula, or the Occupant is sad. And our Occupant is a... Is a... So drum roll, please. I know you're all waiting. Bated breath. Ancient Hero of Zamor. Uh, the Zamor are long-lived beings, cold winds. Uh, they fought against the giants on the side of Godfrey in the War of the Giants. And it looks like one of them followed uh, Godfrey and his Tarnished on their long march. But he couldn't. They, she couldn't leave with them. Maybe the weeping is that she is sad that, you know, she can't maybe leave with one of her Tarnished lovers. You know, I don't know. Could be. Uh, but she drops a really interesting item for someone who was, you know, down here uh, where the <laughs> where the tarnish got kicked off. We got Radigan's Scar Seal. So we have Radigan's Church up on the hill, and then we have a Scar Seal with the lattice. Um, an eye engraved with an Elden Rune, said to be the seal of King Consort Radigan. It raises all of your physical attributes, but increases damage taken. These seals represent the lifelong duty of those chosen by the gods. So an ancient hero of Zamor, who fought in the War of the Giants, is has a lifelong duty to King Consort Radigan. That's very interesting. Um, it kind of gives like a new implications. You know, Mesmer's apparently, you know, it looks like Mesmer's impaling stuff is also in the mountaintops of the giants. So it seems like Merica Radigan. Uh, there is something going on. You know, I, I, I see a lot of people who think that um, Nicola, Melania, and I guess now Mesmer have to be younger than uh, Rikard, Ronnie, and Radon. Because how could uh, Radigan have children with America if he's not at the capital yet? Well, you got to remember that Radigan is America, so we don't know when they could have children. Nicola is eternally youthful, so you don't know how old he is. Melania is eternally rotting and decaying, so you can't tell how old she is. She also has memory loss, so she can't tell you. She doesn't remember. And then we have this new Mesmer guy who has his, uh, he's got kind of like Roman uh, gladiatorial armor, which is much older than the things that we see in the lands between. Uh, and he has red hair, so I think it leads us to believe that Radigan's children are much older than probably the other demigods that we see uh, in our main playthroughs. And this ancient hero is Amor. Uh, has a seal representing lifelong duty chosen by the gods, and it's Radigan. Another thing that's interesting is that the eye is engraved with an Elden Rune. Um, only the Scar Seals and the Sore Seals ever use that language, Elden Rune. And it leads me to believe that these types of runes, the Lattice, um, and then Merica's Rune, the, you could kind of see it down there, and then maybe the Rune of Death, those are Elden Runes. Like, those are the... Those are the those are the runes that you need for everything to work. If we think about it, there may be there act, there may be three Elden runes. And let me let's, let's work through this thought. We have uh, Merica's Elden rune. Looks like the crucifixion. Uh, it, let's say let's say that is the Elden rune of life. She is the one who bestows gifts. She dispose, uh, bestows blessings. She, she's the life giver. She's the mother figure, she, you know. So that is the rune of life. Then we have Radigan's lattice. And a lattice, I think, is used in gardening so you can uh, have vines creep up it. It's also um, a kind of a symbol of connection. You know, these are crisscross lines, maybe in stitching. You can connect things together. So what would the third Elden rune be? Well, probably the rune of death, the opposite of the rune of life. So when you have the Elden rune of life and the Elden Rune of Death 
combine on the Elden Rune of the Lattice, then, you know, you kind of have everything in together in harmony. Life, death, all of it wrapped, intertwined in a spiral on the scar seal, on the lattice. So, you know, that's just a thought. You know, this is the only time we see Elden Rune. Um, that may be the other Elden Rune might be that uh, that death rune. You know, it'll be interesting we find if we find a new scar seal or sword seal in the DLC and if it uses that Elden Rune language. All right, where to next? Oh, we're coming up on another church. It's got the uh, Headless Mausoleum Knights. We're not really going to talk too much about them. You know, I have a whole video about the Eclipse. Uh, and I think also I forget to pick up uh, the Eclipse Eater Shield, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, but we find the fourth church, America. First church is up in the mountaintops. This is the last church. Third church is in Limgrave. Second church is... I don't remember where the second church is, but it's interesting that we have the fourth church of America and then we have the church with Radigan in it. I'm assuming that this church is much older, um, probably, you know, whenever Godfrey's first campaign ended and they took over the, um, and they took over the Weeping Peninsula. Oh, so here's cool stuff. So we get this ghost, um, and he says, there it is, the tower, uh, Finally, I can return to our home, bathed in rays of gold. So I'm assuming that this guy's probably like a tarnished. Uh, he's looking at the Tower of Return, and the Tower of Return is what takes you to Leyendel. Um, and we'll talk about that later when we actually get to it. Uh, knocking down the Wandering Mausoleum. So I, I wanted to look at the, the mausoleum for a really specific purpose. Uh, first is that this is one of the areas that when the mausoleum falls, the mausoleum knights or the soldiers start dying it doesn't happen everywhere but here is one of the spots so the bell stops ringing and the knights die you know so it seems like maybe the bell is what's keeping them alive but this doesn't happen everywhere then when you go inside this is where the interesting thing is let's fast forward a little so you go inside and then you have statues of radigan holding a sword um i know that you know it might be contentious to say that's radigan but the radigan is known for being a champion and being learned and you find this stat <clears throat> you find this statue everywhere with either a sword or a book um you find it in noxtella you find it in all the divine towers you find it also in stormville castle but not where you would think it's uh down um beneath the where the ground is opening up and where you get to a uh, godwin's visage you find them all thrown down there and one of the reasons I think that these are Radigan statues is because Godric, um, he believes that he is part of, you know, Godfrey's lineage. He's part of the Golden Lineage. So by right, he thinks he should be king. Yet his ancestor gets banished and then Radigan becomes the second Elden Lord. You know, by blood right, he doesn't get it. Uh, you, you know, there might be contention saying, well, you know, the Elden Lord is, a, you know, crown is warranted by strength. So, you know, why would it pass down? because his uh, father had it or his grandfather or whatever. Well, I just, you know, if you're royal, that's what you assume. You assume you're just going to, just because you're royal, you're going to get it. You know, hate to break it to you guys, but uh, Queen Elizabeth isn't anything special just because she's the queen. She didn't earn it. She was just given the crown. And, um, you know, that seems like that would be the normal, um, the normal, you know, assumption for someone like in Godric or Godfroy's position. So we find these statues thrown into the bottom of this pit they're all there. Uh, maybe they just fell there, or maybe Godric's like, I hate the guy who, you know, uh, stole my ancestor's spotlight, and, you know, I should have been passed down Elden Lord by now, and here I am. I'm stuck in Stormvale Castle because that veiled monarch says that he's really Godfrey's son. So, yeah. It's interesting that you find these in the Wandering Mausoleums and everywhere else. You also see the Barnacles, too. Another... Um, indication that death is uh, matched with um, uh, the underwater. Uh, not really anything interesting here for the type of research that we're doing, other than that this is the Witchbane Ruins. It's guarded by a Graven School, and then we find Selen being tortured in the basement because she can't die, and the, the Karians don't like her. 
because she's uh, she does uh, primeval sorcerer nonsense. They also torture uh, Erdtree commoners here too. So it looks like con- uh, the Karians don't like the Erdtree uh, that much either. Uh, and then we get the ambush shard, which is the um, the uh, Celia uh, assassin. So you know that guy probably was a Celian assassin who was watching over. Uh, uh, Sella, 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 assassin watching over Sella, 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 whatever her name is. You know, it's all confusing. Probably not an ally, because you know, he's also on fire. You know, you find a lot of burning corpses everywhere, and it, I think it's that you know, since you can't die, it's a bunch of uh. It's a bunch of people just like trying to burn themselves alive. You know, you go to the uh, where you fight Agheel. It looks like they're trying to, you know, burn so they can finally die. Um, get a bunch of these guys who can't die roaming the beach. Uh, we get the isolated merchant. I think he has some interesting items. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking. It, it wouldn't be in the video if he didn't have something interesting. So what does he got? Oh, yeah. So he's got cool stuff. So he has... Um, I think the two coolest things here is the Zweihander, because it's a big sword, needs two hands to hold. That would make sense if you're part of uh, Godfrey's uh, Tarnished. You're warriors, you're tough, you should have a two-hand sword. And then it also has Festering Fingers, so... These Tarnished are returning to the Lands Between, and they're going to go to the Tower of Return to get back to Round Table Hold. And on their way, some of them might pick up a Festering Finger, maybe you know, one of uh, the... The, the Formless Mother, the uh, Moog, the Omens, Blood Cult, um, to start turning on each other. So this is, we're seeing our first indication, you know, not just Vare, but more ancient than that, more, you know, further in the past when the Tarnish first starts showing up, that they may have been being indoctrinated away from the Two Fingers, away from their Finger Maidens, away from the Path of Elden Lord, all the way back here to become uh, Bloody Fingers. And this merchant has a few of them to sell. Uh, yeah, we don't have to look at this anymore. We'll fast forward. Oh, so uh, this was interesting. Uh, you know, we find these coffins everywhere. You have people being buried in them, but you know they're above ground, and they are not giving Urtree burial. Um, in A Song of Ice and Fire, the Starks of Winterfell. Um, are buried in uh, in, st- in stone coffins with iron swords on them in the catacombs of Winterfell, where the first men were used to be uh, buried in these uh, barrows, uh, which are just like burial mounds in the ground. So the first men who the Starks have their lineage to would do burial into the ground, I guess, you know, being fed to the werewoods, possibly, but the Starks would be buried in these stone coffins. Um, this is interesting that you see, so this is the Tower of Return, where you can go back to Landell, the Round Table Hold. You have these crosses that mimic Marika's cross. They also mimic the Rune Arc. Um, and on here you have people screaming, and they scream at night. In the 1.0 version of the game, the Guilty Hood, this one right up here on the top left, it's explicit that this is for Tarnished. And, uh, in, in the base game... Uh, it doesn't say that anymore. But if we think about it, if these are tarnished, if when you find people screaming on these crosses, these are tarnished who can't die, the tarnished, you know, nobody really likes these guys when they return. Nobody wants them there. Um, it says it in one of the uh, Two Fingers uh, spells, you know, you're going to make enemies of everyone, the fire monks, the dragonites. Um, it would make sense that when the tarnished returned, some people will be like, nah, it ain't happening. And then they got strung up on these Marika crosses. Um, so it would just make sense. We, and yeah, so I think we can say that the 1.0 uh, information there might be accurate. And then we find a Godric's Knight, which would also make sense why Godric would have knights here, because if there's tarnished who are returning to the lands between from the Weeping Peninsula to go into the Tower of Return, this would be a great spot for him to pick up a fresh batch to do some uh, grafting. So here we get a little bit of Godric uh, motivation. Then you would get to your Tower of Return. I'm a Tarnish, just came back in a boat. And voila, I am now in Landell, and I'm right above the Fortified Manor, which is the Round Table Hold. We see uh, Radigan statues again. Uh, what's interesting about the Round Table Hold, and um, I'm going to probably cut to some video so you can see this. So we have the Round Table Hold. This is where the Tarnish would meet. 
and it's located in Landell, the royal capital, where they would meet and they would try to become Elden Lord. When we play the game, the the we go to the table of lost grace, which is somewhere else. It's connected to the Erd Tree somehow, but it's not physically within the lands between. And we meet either people there or sometimes red phantoms can interact with us. Specifically, Mad Tongue Albrich, who removed his tongue, and the Dungator, who speaks to us as a spirit within there. Um, when we talk to Roderica in the Roundtable Hold, she says that, um, oh, we finally are at the covert headquarters of the Two Fingers. So many legendary heroes were here. You know, I don't think she is talking about the round table hold with the table of lost grace and Hugh and all that. I think she's talking about the fortified manor that when we read things about the round table hold, we should be thinking about the fortified manor, the round table hold that we're in. I don't think is really our for really the round table hold. And one of the reasons I think that is every single site of grace in the game has roots growing up from under it. Um, and it's supposed to be the grace of the Erd tree. So, you know, I think we'll see one right now. You can kind of look at it. There's little roots coming up. But the only one, there's two graces in the game that don't have those roots. One is the table of lost grace, which is just a giant grace floating on this table. And the other is the mimic grace. Cut to me showing you the mimic grace. This is an item that you can use that's supposed to, it's made of like human bone shards and stuff. And it's supposed to look like a sight of grace. It doesn't do anything and it just points in whatever direction. So, you know, it's possible, it's very possible that the round table hold that we're hanging out in is not the round table hold that most tarnished went to. Um, it could be just for special tarnish that gets sent to this round table hold. Um, possibly uh, Merrick is doing, uh, since Hugh is there. Maybe, maybe it's Nicola's doing that we're there. Um, in an interview in one of the game guides, um, Miyazaki says that, you know, we the roundtable holds very interesting, but we're not ready to reveal why it is the way it is yet. Um, oh, here I wanted to... Uh, I think we're going to look at the map. So this bridge ends kind of abruptly, uh, and it goes out to nowhere. It's supposed to go to a divine tower, but it doesn't. And um, I think uh, one of the comments... One of my commenters said that, like, maybe this is where the Shadowlands is supposed to be, and, you know... It, that's why it's kind of broken up. It's under this veil. The um, it's under this veil, and you know whatever magic caused it, kind of just like plucked it. Uh, I was thinking that it's probably in this area near Farm Azula, Kaled, but you know maybe it's kind maybe of like, there is a lake right here uh, with this divine tower, and then that land mass land mass goes out. Maybe this whole thing, maybe the whole center is supposed to be um, the land of shadow. Uh, I was figuring it was going to be over here, but, you know, it makes sense if it's in the center there, and that's why this divine bridge is all broken. So, yeah, round table hole is very interesting. I want to do a video on that, too, but, you know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, we find a blessed dew talisman um, depicting drop of Erd Tree sap. It was once thought that the blessed sap of the Erd Tree would drip from the ba from its boughs forever, but the age of plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Erd Tree became more of an object of faith. Um, I think that is between. Oh, this was a cave. I forgot to for us to go through. Um, I think the you know the age of plenty is Godfrey's age. Um, my timeline is how I understand it. Godfrey's age is the age of plenty with the Erd Tree its sap at its due Erd Tree burial. The night of the black knives happens, and then the sap stops. Godfrey is banished, and then the age of like enlightenment happens with Radigan, and the Erd Tree becomes a symbol of faith. While Radigan is trying to do some, you know, some Renaissance stuff and learn. Uh, this is this cave is beneath um, near the Fourth Church America, I think. Yeah, it's by the Fourth Church America. We get some poison and rock guys down here, which is interesting. But uh, what's really interesting is when we get to the end of the cave. So I'm just gonna fast forward a bit. Um, but it is interesting that we have, like, guys who have rot. Oh, that was actually interesting. So we have the, uh, fin fur calling finger remedy, so it seems like this was a tarnished who kind of got lost in this cave, and that sucks for him. So we fight the Miranda Blossom. There is, a uh, cut content that says, like, that's, like, a thing that's called, like, Miranda's Powder or Miranda's, um, 
talisman or something, and it says that like sh that like Miranda was the first Erd tree or like the first god of the Erd tree or something like that. It's cut content, so I don't you know like taking it too seriously because um, it could change. It could be changed, but we have this hole in the cave, and then it drops the Viridian Amber Medallion, which is similar to the Crimson Medallion that the Merchant was selling. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a treasure, uh, for Godfrey's age. So what I'm kind of thinking is that a tarnish kind of threw this amber medallion with the old sap down into this cave. And then it somehow blossomed into this Miranda bloom. The Miranda bloom starts emitting its toxic cloud. And now you have a poison cave. So if that logic makes sense to you, we kind of see that the rot is with part of the Erd tree, and somehow with the amber, with its sap turned amber, we could create a poisonous plant. We could create new life, and we could create poison slump and get some rot guys who want to hang out with us. Um, so, you know, I see somebody toss this down into the cave, and then that flower popped up. You know, that's the visual storytelling I'm getting from this. We get our golden seed. They got flung out when the uh, Erd tree was shattered, and they started plopping these little trees. A little picture of Castle Morn. We're almost there. We're almost to Castle Morn, guys. We're almost there. Uh, poison Mist. Those who dwell within poison know rot all too well. The death that begets life that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is a cycle of rebirth put into practice. Um, rot seems a little opposed to the current golden order, so it seems that rebirth isn't something that is very common for the... Uh, you know, for, for, for people within this time. So that's kind of where I also think that herb tree burial is not a, pro a process of rebirth, but is something more akin to maybe putting into a hive mind or just complete destruction and absorption from the tree. Uh, we get more potentially crucified tarnished on this rock. That really sucks for them. And uh, I don't think there's any interesting items over here. Yeah, there's nothing. We get angry jellyfish, and we get angry jellyfish so that we have angry spirits. These are angry spirits. These are jellyfish spirits. I think these are supposed to represent people's spirits floating around. They're pissed off. Uh, and we got a few cherishes looking off the ocean. You know, maybe these are spirits of people who are angry waiting for the tarnish. Maybe they just were watching for the tarnish, and they didn't know they were on the other side of the peninsula. Who's to say? Maybe that was one of the tarnish that got left behind. Uh, I'm look oh, yeah, I'm looking out of the map because I was like, what is he looking at? Uh, I, I don't know. Who knows? All right. So we got the Siege of Castle Morn. A lone hero fights for his vengeance, only to fall at the hand of Lord Godfrey. So um, we have Godfrey and his Crucible Knights. Remember, Crucible Knights. Uh, he's on the side of the Crucible. And the Castle Morn has a lot of Banished Knights, uh, Stormhawk imagery. Banished Knights got this dragon ornamentation. So a lone hero fights for his vengeance only to fall at the hand of Lord Godfrey. There is theories that this is supposed to be maybe it's Radigan they're talking about because the the misbegotten and the Leon misbegotten they are the ones who are you know running the castle right now. But their sword We'll get it. I guess we'll get into it. But just think about it. if Godfrey is supposed to be the Erd tree and the Crucible, if he's supposed to be some sort of representation of the Crucible, two of his children are omen or omens. They're Crucible related. Um, he has Sirash on his back. And we saw the lion dancer who had Crucible horns. Um, it seems that Godfrey is, you know, he's kind of allied or related to the Crucible. Um. And this Gilone hero, Castle Morn, Castle Morn appears not to be a crucible castle or an Erd tree castle originally, but a banished knight from Missoula, Sun Realm castle. Um, he wants to fight for vengeance, and Godfrey just kicks his ass. I'm, I kind of think that this may have occurred. So you have the Sun Realm. Let's just say, you know, in, in my mind, I think the Sun Realm is the dragon's. Uh, domain. This is when whoever was, whenever the dragons ruled, maybe not the ancient dragons, but dragon related, you know, the dragons might not have been around um, when the sun realm was, you know, slowly fading away. We have, um, you know, this, this sun realm 
it fades away. It loses probably to Godfrey in the Erd Tree. You know, the sun doesn't really have much power when you got this big golden tree in the sky casting all this light, you know, through morning and night. Um, Godfrey gets banished. He's the Tarnish now, and he's walking down to the Weeping Peninsula to take his boat home. And there is this Sun Realm guy who is just so pissed off. He wants his kingdom back. He wants the Sun Realm to rise again. And he is going to fight for vengeance against the guy who destroyed his nation and his pride. And then Godfrey just kicks his ass again because he's he's a tough guy. He's also a big POS. Uh, let's fast forward a bit. More tarnished. We're two times speed now. Um, maybe more tarnished uh, being crucified and getting high tide. All right. Normal speed. Okay. To come into Castle Morn, we got the dead Godric soldiers, most likely from the Mist Beyond. Here we see the banished knight weapons. We see the dragon armaments for the flame cannons. So dragon, arm uh, dragon ornamentation on these flame cannons and then banished knight swords. We come up here into Castle Morn, and what do you know? We get this mass... We get, we get Mesmer's butterflies floating around and all of these Erd Tree commoners killed uh, on a pile and the Crucible rising up in revolt, you know? We're sick and tired of being kicked around by, you know, the Crucible used to be what's up and now your civilized tree is, you know, enslaving us. So we, uh, we're fighting back. And for some reason, you know, Mesmer's butterflies are hanging around here. So does Mesmer... Mesmer has dragons and snakes on him, so, you know, it could be... No, we're, we're doing speculation here. We're just trying to think through. Um, if this is a Sun Realm place, and maybe Mesmer is related to the Sun Realm in any way, or at least dragons, you know, he's got the dragon eye, he's got the dragon helmet, he's got the snakes. So it seems that it's possible that, you know, maybe that's why the butterflies are here. I know there's fire here, and that's why, but, you know, we have to look deeper than that. Maybe it's because of Mesmer's influence over Castle Morn. Maybe not directly now anymore, but at one point, he may have been a force for this long-faded Sun Realm, or for the dragons, or for whoever. Uh, and then we just, you know, we have these misbegotten who are uh, uh, crucible-related, rising up against this Spanish Knight Castle. I, you know, I might be repeating myself a bit, but, you know, it's this is the type of stuff I don't think I've seen anyone else online, you know, talk about. Maybe a few people have talked about how these used to be banished knights, but, you know, what's the relation between these crucible enemies, these misbegotten, and the, um, and the crucible? I mean, and the, uh, Sun Realm. Actually, I don't even think anyone calls the banished knights Sun Realm. I don't think anyone talks about the Sun Realm. It's just me. But when the DLC comes out, I... If if the Land of Shadow is not the Sun Realm, jeez, I'm going to be upset. I won't be upset. It'll be fine. Um, F Iron Cleaver. Fairly large Iron Cleaver, commonly used by the maltreated and misbegun. Steeped in resentment, these weapons are sung wildly and relentlessly, often after uh, rushing up to foes. So, you know, the misbegotten, they are mistreated, and they are, uh, they got a lot of resentment. Uh, probably, you know, I think it's because the Crucible probably just got sold out. Um, civilization, you know, we have the Erd Tree. The Crucible is the primordial form of the Erd Tree. But civilization has to come through. And we don't want any of this, uh, this animalistic stuff anymore. We're men. We're, 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 we're selling you out. So I think we might see a case of, um, in, the, in the Land of Shadows and Shadow of the Erd Tree, we will see where the civilization, the men... The, man, the humans um, kind of like betrayed the crucible. It's kind of interesting that um, the crucible is all animalistic things, feathers, scales. Um, oh, before we talk to uh, Edgar, I want to talk about the crucible more. It's all feathers and scales, yet the only, uh, and, and, and it's very animalistic, horns. Um, but there's two types of animals that seem to be okay under the Erd Tree. Um, you have the kind of grafted Stormhawks and uh, Stormville Castle, but I'm really talking about beasts. Sharash, the lion, the king of beasts, grafted onto Godfrey's back, and then guardian lions, chained up, horns excised, used as, like, slave weapons. 
And then you have wolves, who are the shadows of Empyreans. So it may be the case that the Erd Tree, their betrayal of the Crucible is now that, you know, kind of like, it's not really a betrayal, but like, you know, if you think of like a dog, like an actual dog, um, you know, they, you, you, we, we train them, we command them, we, we put them in cages, we make them do work for us, they hunt for us, they sniff for drugs, they guard our areas. Um, you know, it seems that, you know, maybe that's the story that's being told here. You know, civilization came through, it allied with nature for a time until it found that we don't need to be allied with nature. We don't have to be one with nature anymore. We could start using nature to our advantage. Civilization grows, these great cities grow. Um, and then nature is thrown to the wayside, except for things that we still deem useful, like a beast, like a dog, like a wolf. So that might be uh, that might be one of the underlying themes we might see um, expanded on. Uh, we have Edgar. Him and I are wearing the same thing, except he doesn't have his helmet. He was ordained by Lord Godric himself, which is you know, kind of interesting if you're for going with the. Um, uh, Godric is part of a bastard line. You know, Godwin isn't really the son of Godfrey. They are uh, dragon aligned and not crucible aligned. Um, it's interesting that Godric uh, makes Edgar, this banished knight, the Castilian of Castle Morn. So that's just, I think, another feather in that cap. He calls them the menials ever build. So here's where we're getting that the banished knights, these dragon folk, are looked down on crucible. Godfrey has his crucible knight, so he's crucible aligned. He might have not always been crucible, you know, actually, he probably, I'm going to say he was probably always crucible aligned, and then civilization came through, and he got pushed out. You know, Godfrey is a little analytic, too. He needs to put a beast on his back to, to, to quell that, that hunger of a, of, a, of a warrior. So, um, it, yeah, it would seem to me that Banished Knight doesn't like crucible. He calls them menials, and they're rebelling. And that Godric is the one who anoints him Castilian of this old Sun Realm fort with all the Banished Knight stuff that's around there. It's interesting that there's no Banished Knights here except for him. So there must, you know, there's not a lot of Banished Knights. Um, the only ones that are left behind are given, it looks like, you know, high command. The rest are Godric soldiers that we find here. Um, I think he also mentions... Um, you know, he, 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 uh, does he mention the sword yet? Yeah. To ensure the treasure sword of Morn does not fall into the wrong hands. Um, this also leads, you know, if we the, the talk about the Revenger again, people thinking that it's, uh, or the hero who rebelled and lost to Godfrey, people thinking that it's Radigan. You know, it seems that it's not Radigan because Radigan is red hair. He, uh, he's like giant aligned. Unless Radigan, Rad, uh, right? Well, Radigan could be. Um, Radigan has the uh, the Leon Misbegotten's, the red hair Misbegotten's, but also Radigan is an anagram for a dragon, and we find his statue at the Dragon Collar Church or something. So you know, maybe he's both. Maybe Radigan is in Radigan's America. So who knows? Uh, <laughs> Radigan has his Leon Misbegotten's who. In the files are the children of Radigan, but is also his name is an anagram for a dragon. Uh, and then we have at Castle Morn, we have these banished knights who wear dragon ornamentation, who have this treasure sword that we're going to get to. Um, and uh, they enslave the crucible, uh, uh, misbegotten. So it's kind of it's kind of weird of you know who where's the where's the allegiance there um, for Radigan. Since Radigan is Merica, and I, you know, I think Merica is a, probably a sympathetic character, um, who probably just got like a bad deal, um, not of her, cho not of her choice. Um, it would make sense. Um, I think the helmet looks cooler than whatever this guy's doing. He's pretty sad. He's a sad boy. Hey, Mesmer's butterflies. All right, we're getting to the end. We're overlooking the edge. You can kind of see the fingerprint graveyard, um, or the fingerprint grave. They have a name for it when we get down there. You see more of the spirits floating around, so there's, you know, the dead are washed up on those shores. The fingerprint um, grave we see in the trailer um, in that blue field of flowers where the red dancer is fighting, just, you know, what we're calling her. Um, so, and we find it in Altus Plateau. So it's very interesting that you find those low locations. 
Um, we've seen cowering misbegotten. Um, and maybe because this, they maybe they were tortured here and they're having memories of that or something's frightening them. Uh, this NPC says, please help me. I'm of noble blood. Noble, most likely, uh, Erd Tree nobility. Uh, if these hideous mongrels eat me, I'll f be forever marred. So it looks like you were eaten, pal, and your soul is just hanging out. Anything but that, please think of this grace. You know, because he wants an Erd Tree burial. Um, if we look at Dungy just quest line, whatever he does causes uh, people to, you know, they can't get born back into the roots and they are, um, they are there. I guess maybe if you're crucible, you can't be born back into the roots. So maybe that's where the Erd tree, um, is, is, is uh, the Erd tree culture turns on the crucible because they only non crucible adjacent things, non animalistic things can get Erd tree burial. I guess I mean, yeah. In the Erd tree burial, you only see human corpses. And things of uh, horns and scales, they, I guess, can't be given Erd Tree Burial. Um, yeah, the Seedbed Curse has all the horns on them. So I guess the, the, the clash is between the beings who can get Erd Tree Burial and those who can't. And if you can't get Erd Tree Burial, I guess, you know, you don't want it. You don't want to give them the Blessed Dew, the Blessed Sap. You don't want, if you can't, if you can't um, assist in fueling progress and f fueling the, the growth of our culture, the growth of this tree, well, then you don't get to participate in the society we were building. So that might be, maybe that's why. Oh, so here's interesting. So in a chest, we find the twin blade talisman. Um, talisman depicting a twin blade and a confessor. The twin blade technique is a tradition of the confessors who closely guard their secrets of how they preserve momentum of their attack. Uh, the confessors are the assassins for the two finger faithful. They're supposed to kill tarnished who stray away from grace, I think. And, uh, it's interesting that in a chest, if it's in a chest that, uh, that should know, to know ownership, it's found at Castle Morn. So we have two finger confessor assassins, um, hanging out in this castle that has crucible slaves and then a banished knight, um, uh, Banished Knights, Sun Realm Knights. This is just a whip, the instrument of pain. People are getting tortured here. And it's also where um, the Confessor, back to the Confessor Talisman, this is also where Tarnished are returning to. So it would make sense that if a Tarnish returns who seems to, more smoldering than butterflies, <laughs> who seems to maybe not be treading the path of Elden Lord, that they would uh, get assassinated. Here we're back to the uh, Spirit Jellyfish. Looks like this might be a dumping ground for bodies. Uh, maybe they wash up on shore. Maybe they're thrown through the back of the castle. We have a giant grave here, so maybe they're the souls to this grave. Um, and then we look back up at the castle, and it's like kind of like magnificent. Um, it reminds me, I think maybe it's like maybe Casterly Rock and Song of Ice and Fire. Maybe not Storm's End, but you know, I think it's Casterly Rock that's built into the to the face of the um, of the coastline. But I don't remember. We're gonna summon Castellan Edgar. He's going to help us uh, get back this storied sword. I mean, he's the one who cares about it, but our Dragon Knight, you know, one Dragon Knight to another, not one Banished Knight to another, he is going to, he's going to assist them. And uh, we're going to fat roll, so we got to put on, we got to put on Vike's Dragon Bolt. So we get that big fingerprint grave. I don't know if it's actually a fingerprint grave, that's what I'm calling it. We got to summon our Sword Hawk, because, you know, this is, the storm is related to the dragons. Um... And we're doing Stormcaller. This guy doesn't stand a chance, you know? I'm just too good. Too good. It didn't have a shot against me. Yeah. Oh, we actually, that's probably the, the spirits, those jellyfish, probably all these dead people. I wonder if it's the, this is, these bodies were dumped here, or maybe they uh, just washed up here. And we get the Grafted Blade Greatsword. We'll talk about that in a moment. I guess, I think we're going to get the name of what this is called in a moment when we sit down at the grace site. The Morn Moan Grave. So this is a Moan Grave. Maybe they're all called Moan Graves because the hole. <laughs> Maybe it's called a Moan Grave because when the wind passes through it, it uh, makes a sound. I don't know. That'd be interesting. That's kind of creative. I didn't make it up. I'm saying George R. R. Martin, Hideotaki Miyazaki are creative. All right. So we get our Grafted Blade Greatsword. Uh, when the game came out, uh, people said this is the only thing that George R. R. Martin did for 
um, <laughs> did for Elden Ring. Um, the story sword of Castle Morn, a revenger's weapon. It is burdened with oceans of anger and regret. So if we're thinking that Castle Morn was owned by banished knights who are part of the Sun Realm, who are part of this dragon culture, this is their storied sword. It's a sword that was owned by someone who wanted revenge, and they just are filled with anger and regret. A lone surviving champion from a country now vanished. Now, this is where I think the Land of Shadows is the Sun Realm. A country now vanished. That could be two things. One, it's a country that don't, it doesn't exist anymore because someone else planted their flag, and they say, this isn't your country anymore. You know, this, uh, you probably see that happening in the world today, and that is the comment I will make on that. Um, or it could be vanished like poof, like uh, the sh- Land of Shadow is just vanished. It's not part of the lands between before. So it could be that their land was just the Sun Realm. Poof, it vanished. Um, so so lone surviving champion of a country now vanished was so determined to continue fighting that he claimed the swords of an entire clan of warriors. So he was determined to continue fighting. Um, that makes me believe that his determination is because the fight should be over. His They lost. His country is gone. But I am going to fight for my country. He claimed the swords of a clan of warriors. Uh, warrior is the title given to, you know, uh, Horalu, to Nefelilu. Uh, it's a title given to the strongest in that clan. If you look at the champion's uh, armor set, it says something along those lines. So here I think we see a Sun Realm, now vanished, or Knight, you know, Dragon Realm, Banished Knight Realm, whatever it is, their country vanished, poof, maybe it's vanished because the Erdtree Empire flattened it and now all their castles are Erdtree castles now, or it's the Land of Shadow and it actually is vanished. Um, He claimed the Sword of Warriors, of Godfrey's Warriors, of the Tarnished, and he was going on revenge because he was filled with anger and regret. So, but now it's back in the hands of a true Banished Knight, who is not a mimic tier pretending to be a banished knight. This is really a banished knight. Uh, then we, we fast forward because I guess, you know, I shouldn't have paused that. Oh, all right. Thank you for keeping the sword away from this fallen creatures. Yeah, they, he doesn't he doesn't like uh, Misbegotten. Uh, and he's going to go live, you know, it's like every single 90s movie, late, late 80s, early 90s. The dad who works too much, he figured out that he really should have stayed with his family um, and now he's going to go do that. And when he gets home for Christmas to devote his life to his child, um, he finds her uh, dead with an axe. So, um, yeah, I think I think that happened in Jingle All the Way, where the kid gets killed with an axe. And then eventually he gets Flame of Frenzy because he's so pissed. Um, yeah, that's the Weeping Peninsula. Uh, I wonder if we actually learned anything or if I just rambled. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, this is just me doing research and just having fun for uh, doing a bigger video and for Shadow of the Earth Tree. Um, the next level I want to do is most likely going to be Far Missoula. Um, that's the one I'm playing through right now. If you want, if you like this type of content, if you like this uh, video type of series, you know, please let me know. Um, I had fun just chatting, uh, and I hope you guys like it too. Um, so we're going to do Farm Azula next. I kind of want to do Volcano Manor. If there's another level that you just want me to look at, like in this way, just so we can kind of have like this conversation about it, you know, let me know. Um, I, you know, this, these are probably going to be long videos, but I think you guys like long videos. And some of the information probably isn't definitive, but, you know, it's a way for us to think and to have a conversation and try to, you know, learn more before we get into Shadow of the Earth Tree. It also gives you uh, uh, a picture into how I analyze the lore and the way the method that I use to try to understand what's going on in the game. Um, you know, it's not just about item descriptions and what they say. It's also where you find them. Uh, where are they located? How are they? Who who's holding it? Where is it around? How far is it away from the earth tree? Things like that. Um, so, all right. Thank you guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know. It's a long one. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, long live the Realm of the Sun. And in the next one, we are going to have the Crucible get revenge from Farm Missoula. Uh, Ceruli uh, has her tree spear, and she's pissed as hell. She wants to hunt some goddamn dragons. So...
Catch you in the next one, guys. Bye.